This series of Book of Mormon lectures is presented by the Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies in cooperation with Brigham Young University's College of Religious Instruction. It is called The Prophets of the Book of Mormon and Their Messages and will explore the Prophets of the Book of Mormon and their invitation to everyone to come unto Christ. Today's lesson is entitled The Prophets of the Brass Plates. The instructor is Robert L. Millett. We continue our discussion of different prophets in the Book of Mormon and their messages. This hour we'll do something a little different. We'll talk about the prophets of the brass plates. The Book of Mormon bears a, an important testimony of the critical nature of record keeping and particularly of the necessity for scriptural re uh, records in the development of and preservation of a civilization. Preservation from both illiteracy and unbelief. You notice that in 1st Nephi chapter 4, you recall, how critical it was that they get those brass plates. Let, let's go to 1st Nephi chapter 4. Beginning, you notice, about um, verse 9, as Nephi encounters Laban. He sees his sword. Verse 10, I was constrained by the Spirit that I should kill Laban. Of course, Nephi's never killed anyone before. But he begins to realize in verse 11 that essentially... Laban has violated uh, the Lord's law. More importantly, the Spirit constrains him again to take his life. Now verse 12, And it came to pass that the Spirit said unto me again, Slay him, for the Lord hath delivered him into thy hands. And in this key verse, Behold, the Lord slayeth the wicked to bring forth his righteous purposes. It is better that one man should perish than that a nation should dwindle and perish in unbelief. You know, I, I've often thought, and Nephi, Nephi takes his life, I've often thought that in years later when Nephite leaders took that sword of Laban and held it up, that it meant many things. Um, it meant the Lord is with us as he was with our fathers, as he protected them in battle, he will protect us. But it occurred to me too that for some people, every time they saw the sword of Laban, they might have thought of this. Um, the scriptures are always bought with a price. In this case, Nephi had to kill a man to get the scriptures. They're bought with a price. The brass plates are an integral part of the Nephite story uh, and message of the Book of Mormon. Let's uh, ponder for a moment on what they contained. Um, what do you remember? What's on the brass plates? Name one or two or three things. The books of the Old Testament. The Pentateuch. Okay, Pentateuch, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. What else? Um, genealogy, uh, showing Lehi's lineage. Good. Uh, a family history, a genealogical lineage, so that when they finally got them, what does Lehi discover? or if he doesn't discover, has confirmed, he is of Joseph, right? What else? Anything else on there? In fact, we've got the first five books. Do we have any more than that? All the prophecies, including some of the prophecies of Jeremiah. So it's pretty contemporary, implying that it's being kept even up into the days of Jeremiah, who's a contemporary with Lehi. I'd like to suggest and, and show today in what we read and study that the, the brass plates, though like our Bible, are very much unlike. They have more. They're more extensive. They're more detailed. Um, in First Nephi chapter 13, remember that when plain and precious truths are to be taken away, let's go to that, that we finally get around to discussing that Bible that had been corrupted and excised. First Nephi 13, We're going to look at about verse 20. First Nephi 13, 20. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld that they did prosper in the land, the Gentiles. And I beheld a book, and it was carried forth among them. And the angel said unto me, Knowest thou the meaning of the book? And I said unto him, I know not. And he said, Behold, it proceedeth out of the mouth of a Jew. So we now begin to talk about the Bible, as it were. 
I, Nephi, beheld it, and he said unto me, The book that thou beholdest is a record of the Jews, which contains the covenants of the Lord, which he hath made unto the house of Israel. And it also containeth many of the prophecies of the holy prophets. And it is a record like unto the engravings which are upon the plates of brass, save there are not so many. That is to say, the brass plates was more extensive than the Bible we would eventually receive. Now, part of the reason why was because, as we learned, this great and abominable church would take away and keep back many of the plain and precious truths and many covenants of the Lord that had been contained in that Bible. Let me add one other detail about the brass plates, and I like the way Elder Bruce R. McConkie said this. In 1984, in an address given at BYU, from various Book of Mormon references, we gain a glimpse of what is on the brass plates. They contain the record of the Jews down to the days of Zedekiah, including the genealogies of the people and the prophecies of the holy prophets, among which are the words of Isaiah and portions of Jeremiah. They contain in their perfect form the Law of Moses and the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They contain the writings of Joseph who was sold into Egypt, than which few have been greater. And on them is found the mysteries of God and the commandments he has given the children of men. They contain books of Holy Scripture of which the world does not dream, including the writings of Zenoch, Nahum, and Zenos. But this is the part I want to stress. Notice. But what interests us more than the books included on the brass plates is the tone and tenor and general approach to the gospel and to salvation that they set forth. They are gospel-oriented and speak of Christ and the various Christian concepts which the world falsely assumes to have originated with Jesus and the early apostles. What we'll notice as we do our tour through the brass plates records today is just how gospel-centered they are and how much they read like the doctrines of the gospel we understand today. Before we do that, I just want to make reference to some things. Remember that uh, one of the major purposes, if we went on reading in 1 Nephi 13, one of the major purposes of the Book of Mormon was to establish the essential truthfulness of the Bible. For many years, you know that we've approach this in the wrong direction. We've gone out trying to prove the Book of Mormon from the Bible. The Lord never intended that. The Lord's purpose is he knew there would come a time when the very Bible itself would be in question. And so he raises up a prophet, restores to him ancient records, gives him power to translate them. They come forth and they help to establish the essential truthfulness. That's why the Lord would say in the 20th section of the Doctrine and Covenants that the Book of Mormon is given for the purpose of proving unto the world that the Holy Scriptures are true. Let me give you an example. Just, if you want an interesting experience, just go through the Book of Mormon looking for what you and I would call biblical people or events. Okay, for example, Lehi and Alma spoke of Adam, Eve, and the Garden of Eden. Aaron, son of Mosiah, read the scriptures concerning the creation, fall, and atonement. Amulek spoke to the people of Ammonihah of Noah and the flood. Amalekai, the record keeper, spoke of the Tower of Babel. Jacob spoke of Abraham sacrificing Isaac and went so far as to tell us that it was a similitude of Christ being sacrificed by the Father. Alma spoke of Abraham paying tithes to Melchizedek and of Melchizedek's greatness. Nephi, son of Helaman, spoke of Abraham's messianic prophecies. Captain Moroni related many of the words of Jacob or Israel before Israel's death. That's a very interesting one. Uh, you might want to make a note that in the 46th chapter of Alma, there's quite a bit of detail there about the prophecies of Jacob of old that we would know from no other place but the Book of Mormon. Moses. Moses is one of the key figures. He's mentioned over and over and over again. Abinadi, he reads the Ten Commandments to the priests of Noah. David and Solomon are mentioned, including the Temple of Solomon. Let me read to you something that uh, Brother Sidney Sperry 
one of the great minds in this church, once wrote about the brass plates. The northern kingdom of Israel, he wrote, fell to the Assyrians when its capital of Samaria capitulated to Sargon II in 722 BC. The forebears of Laban may have fled to Jerusalem to prevent the sacred records from falling into alien hands. Lehi's grandmother or great-grandfather may have left his northern home for Jerusalem in order to prevent his children from intermarrying and making religious compromises with the foreigners brought into the land by the Assyrians. Brother Sperry then uh, asked the following question. What happened to the keeping of sacred records when the Israelites became sharply divided on political grounds? That is, the northern tribes from the southern tribes. So much so that the two nations were enemies. What happened to the records? He then suggested this answer. The prophets in both nations probably paid little attention to the political lines of division, but it's improbable that all of them had their words recorded in the scriptures of both nations. From the time of the division until the fall of the northern kingdom in 722 BC, the brass plates may well have been the official scripture of the ten tribes. It is probable that some prophets wrote on these plates whose writings may not have been recorded on the records kept in Judah, meaning in the south. Were Zenus, Zenoch, Nahum, and Isaiah, excuse me, among them? They were all Hebrew prophets known to the Nephites, but their names do not appear in our current Old Testament. It is also possible that the writings of some prophets in Judah were not placed on the brass plates during the period under consideration, but of this we have no way of knowing. Let me just have you look at a couple of passages. Let's just open now to 3rd Nephi. Wouldn't it be nice if all of the stuff on the brass plates, details, origins, content, were in one chapter? But it's not. So let's go to 3rd Nephi, chapter 10. 3rd Nephi, chapter 10. Again, our, our context here is the Savior's voice is being heard by the people before his coming to the Nephites, okay? Would someone like to read for us verses 15 and 16 of chapter 10? Who's got it? Please. Behold, I say unto you, yea, many have testified of these things at the coming of Christ, and were slain because they testified of these things. Let me just say, these things have to do with uh, events associated with his coming, destructions and so forth associated with his coming to the Americas. Now notice Notice this language very carefully and see what we learn from verse 16 about Zenos and Zenoch, okay? Yea, the prophet Zenos did testify of these things, and also Zenos spake concerning these things because they testified particularly concerning us who are of the remnant of their seed. They testified of us who are the remnant of their seed. Now that just sounds an awful lot like I, we, wrote a lot about Zenos and Zenoch because they're of the same tribe we are, Joseph. Do you see what I'm getting at? These people are kind of heroes. Zenos and Zenoch are heroes of the Nephites. What else do I know about them? Um, let's go back to Helaman chapter 8. Can we tie them down time-wise? Can we, can we tie down Zenos, Zenoch, Nahum, Isaiah? Uh, the answer is not very well, but let's see what we can establish. Verse 19, Helaman 8, 19. L let me just have you look back at the previous page. Notice who we're citing. We're talking about Moses knowing about the Messiah. Verse 17, we're talking about Abraham knowing about the Messiah. Now, verse 19. And now I would that ye should know that even since the days of Abraham there have been many prophets that have testified these things. Yea, behold, the prophet Zenos did testify boldly for the which he was slain. What things? The coming of Christ. And behold also Zenoch and Isaiah and Isaiah and Jeremiah and so forth. I mean, what do I know about their time? Well, I think the phrase, since the days of Abraham. That doesn't help a whole lot because, I mean, somewhere after what? 1800 B.C. We notice here that for his testimony, Zenos is put to death. Flip back to Alma chapter 33.
Alma 33, speaking now of Zenoch, okay? Zenoch, or Zenoch, verse 17, Alma 33, 17. And now, my brethren, you see that a second prophet of old, Zenoch in this case, has testified of the Son of God, and because the people would not understand his words, they stoned him to death. One of the very haunting messages of the Book of Mormon is that the testimony of Jesus is costly. Think about Lehi. Early in our story, Lehi begins to, he learns some important things and he begins to preach. And the people respond. And what do they want to do? Take his life. Think of, we've already talked about Zenos and Zenoch. Think about um, Abinadi. Why do they take his life? Not, ju not just because he called them to repent, but because he testified that Christ would come to earth, take a physical body, and uh, become human. Okay? That was not a popular thing among the wicked. And so, Zenos and Zenith put to death because of their testimonies. Let's go now to some specific teachings uh, from the brass plates. Let's back up to 2 Nephi chapter 2. Who's our teacher in 2 Nephi chapter 2? Who's our teacher and who's our student? Lehi is the teacher. Who's the specific student? Jacob. Let's turn over to verse 17. I, Lehi, according to the things which I have read. I would have to presume he's talking about the brass plates, especially because of what's going to follow. Okay? Um... Would someone like to start reading there, verse 17, for us? Please. And I, Lehi, according to the things which I have read, must needs suppose that an angel of God, according to that which is written, had fallen from heaven, wherefore he, be he became a devil, having sought that which was evil before God. And because he had fallen from heaven and had become miserable forever, he sought also the misery of all mankind. Wherefore he said unto Eve, Yea, even that old serpent who is the devil, who is the father of all lies, wherefore he said, Partake of the forbidden fruit, and ye shall not die, but ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. We could go on, and so what is the first thing Lehi teaches? Because of what I've read, I know something about the fall of Lucifer in the pre-mortal life. One of the points, I better make it here before I forget it, one of the important points I want to make is this. I'm convinced, after years of study on one particular area, that the, the closest approximation you and I have to the brass plates, one of the best ways we can get close to understanding what's, what was on the brass plates is Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible. If you want to know uh, what was there beyond what's here, obviously, in the Book of Mormon, look at the JST. Now, see, for example, the Book of Moses in the Pearl of Great Price, that, of course, is Joseph Smith's translation of the early chapters of Genesis. It's a fascinating thing just to study 2 Nephi 2 and then read the Book of Moses, and you'll find the language unmistakably similar. It's as if Lehi draws upon an ancient record we know as the brass plates. Joseph Smith is having revealed to him ancient things just as well through his inspired translation. So, according to things which I had read, the fall of Lucifer, we would read that, for example, in Moses chapter 4. Joseph Smith's translation. Look at verses 2 Nephi 2. Look at 22 through 25. And now, behold, if Adam had not transgressed, he would not have fallen, but he would have remained in the Garden of Eden, and all things which were created must have remained in the same state in which they were after they were created, and they must have remained forever and had no end. And they would have had no children, wherefore they would have remained in a state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery, doing no good, for they knew no sin. But behold, all things have been done in the wisdom of him who knoweth all things. Adam fell, that men might be, and men are, that they might have joy. And let's go on. And the Messiah cometh in the fullness of time, that he may redeem the children of men from the fall. So there we have creation, fall, atonement. He learned that where? According to what he's read. 
Now, I don't rule out the fact, and we shouldn't, that Lehi could have learned these things, and as the Book of Mormon prophets hereafter could have, by independent revelation. But they often drew upon the teachings of the ancients, okay? You and I could go and read about the creation, the fall, and atonement in Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible. What we would have is Moses chapters 2, 3, 4, in the Pearl of Great Price. Let's back up to 1 Nephi 19. 1 Nephi 19. Let's begin about verse 10. 1 Nephi 19, 10. Um, notice what's going on here. Nephi is talking about things that are sacred to him. Um, verse 7, the things which some men esteem to be of great worth, both to the body and the soul, others set it not. He talks about even the Son of God, do they set it not, meaning they trample, they trample him under their feet in the sense that they set him at not, they count him as unimportant. But now verse 10. We need somebody to read 10, 11, and 12. Please. And the God of our fathers who were led out of Egypt, out of bondage, and also were preserved in the wilderness by him, yea, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and the God of Jacob, yieldeth himself according to the words of the angel, as a man into the hands of wicked men to be lifted up according to the words of Zenoch, and to be crucified according to the words of Nehem, and to be buried in the sepulcher according to the words of Zenos which he spake concerning the three days of darkness, which should be a sign given of his death unto those who should inhabit the isles of the sea, more especially given unto those who are of the house of Israel. Let's just stop there for a second. Look at the detail that came through. Let me ask you, what detail do we know about the crucifixion, death, rise of Christ from our present Old Testament? Not much detail. I suppose Isaiah 53 is as detailed as anything we have, and we certainly don't get this kind of detail. Notice what these men are preaching. Lifted up, according to Zenoch, crucified, according to Nahum, buried in a sepulcher, according to Zenos, and Zenos also spake concerning three days of darkness that would accompany. See, that's very specific. Go on, 11 and 12. For thus spake the prophet, The Lord God shall surely visit all the house of Israel at that day, some with his voice because of their righteousness, unto their great joy and salvation, and others with the thunderings and the lightnings of his power by tempest, by fire, and by smoke and vapor of darkness, and by the opening of the earth, and by mountains which shall be carried up. Do you see the particulars, the details there? That, that just is not in our Old Testament. I want you to notice, too, the number of times he says, The prophet. The prophet. May I suggest that he's talking about Zenos. Zenos, a very significant prophet. In fact, some years ago when Elder McConkie talked about the brass plates, he also said it this way, I do not think I overstate the matter when I say that next to Isaiah himself, who is the prototype, pattern, and model for all the prophets, there was not a greater prophet in all Israel than Zenos. And our knowledge of his inspired writings is limited to the quotations and paraphrasing summaries found in the Book of Mormon. Notice now as we move along the number of times reference is made to the prophet. Okay? Continue, please. And all these things must surely come, saith the prophet Zenos, and the rocks of the earth must rend, and because of the groanings of the earth, many of the kings of the isles of the sea shall be wrought upon by the Spirit of God to exclaim, the God of nature suffers. Now just look ahead in the verses that follow. Look at verse 13. As for those who are at Jerusalem, saith the prophet. Verse 14, second line, saith the prophet. Verse 15, saith the prophet. Verse 16, second to last line, the prophet, Zenos. Notice they refer to him sort of like we refer to Joseph Smith. If I say the prophet, I'm reading from the teachings of the prophet. Nobody here wonders what I'm talking about. You know who I'm talking about. Zenos seemed to be like that. Isaiah and Zenos are big in the eyes of the Nephites, okay? So you notice the, the, the uh, detail on the life and death of Christ. Let's go to chapter 33 of Alma again. Remember, remembering now what Elder McConkie said? How interesting we find not only certain writings, but a tone and a tenor and a gospel flavor about those writings. Alma 33. Notice what we have here in chapter 33. 
Let's look at our background. Browse around for a second. Where are we? We're in the middle of something. What are we in the middle of? It's the talk to the Zoramites. Yeah, this is Alma and his colleagues, his missionary colleagues, speaking, preaching to the Zoramites. We've already given chapter 32, which is the most famous chapter on faith, but frankly, 32 is only a partial story without 33, because now who stands up? Amulek stands up to give like testimony, supporting, confirming testimony, and nobody, notice what he wants to do. There's a pattern among the Nephites as to how they preach the gospel. The great teachers in the Book of Mormon always do it a certain way. They stand up, they introduce the subject, and then they do the first thing they do. They go back and they cite the ancient prophets. Doop, 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 and then they do something else. Then they bear their own witness, okay? Every one of them. Now notice what Amulek does. Um, I mean, what's the problem with the, the Zoramites? They've been kicked out of their synagogues. They feel they cannot worship. And so notice the approach he's going to take. This is still Alma, isn't it? It's not Amulek yet. He's chapter 34. Alma is going to preach a little more, then Amulek will confirm. Let's pick up with verse 2. Alma said unto them, Behold, ye have said that ye could not worship your God because ye are cast out of your synagogues. But well, behold, I say unto you, if you suppose that you cannot worship God, you do greatly err, and you ought to search the scriptures. If you suppose that they have taught you this, you do not understand them. Now notice what he's going to do. Who will he refer to? Do you remember to have read what Zenos, the prophet of old, has said concerning prayer or worship? For he said, and this is, here we have a quotation from Zenos. Here's Zenos. Thou art, it, it's a, it seems to be part of a prayer, as it were. Thou art merciful, O God. For thou hast heard my prayer, even when I was in the wilderness. Yea, thou wast merciful when I prayed concerning those who were mine enemies, and thou didst turn them to me. Yea, O God, and thou wast merciful unto me when I did cry unto thee in my field, when I did cry unto thee in my prayer, and thou didst hear me. And again, O God, when I did turn to my house, thou didst hear me in my prayer. And when I did turn unto my closet, O Lord, and prayed unto thee, thou didst hear me. Don't you find it interesting that when Amulek does get up in the next chapter and starts preaching, he talks to them about prayer and about what they ought to pray over. And what does he talk about? Your flocks, your fields, and where do you do it? In your houses, in your closets. What are they relying upon? They're relying upon the testimony of Zenos. Do you see what I'm saying? Verse what? Were we eight? Yea, thou art merciful unto thy children when they cry unto thee to be heard of thee and not of men. The Savior is going to use a similar testimony in Matthew 6 when he talks about that. And thou wilt hear them. Yea, O God, thou hast been merciful unto me and heard my cries in the midst of thy congregations. This is all one prayer. Yea, and thou hast also heard me when I have been cast out and have been despised by mine enemies. Yea, thou didst hear my cries and wast angry with mine enemies. And thou didst visit them in thine anger with speedy destruction. Prayer continues. Thou didst hear me, and this gets interesting. Thou didst hear me because of mine afflictions and my sincerity, and it is because of thy Son that thou hast been thus merciful unto me. Therefore I will cry unto thee in all mine afflictions, for in thee is my joy, for thou hast turned thy judgments away from me because of thy Son. Now what am I saying? This is the point. It's not only that he's drawing upon the teachings of Zenos to establish that you can pray anywhere. That's important. But notice what he does. We discover in the brass plates a concept of Godhead that's very much like the concept we have. What's the concept of Godhead you and I find in the Old Testament? Jehovah. You don't think about Father and Son in the Old Testament. Here we find a Father, a Son, and the Father who turns away his judgment because of the atoning sacrifice of the Son. Now let's go on. Verse 12. And now Alma said unto them, Do ye believe those scriptures which have been written by them of old? Behold, if you do, you must believe what Zenos said. For behold, he said, Thou hast turned away thy judgments because of thy son. Now behold, my brethren, I would ask if you've read the scriptures. If you have, how can you disbelieve on the Son of God? Remember, that was one of their problems too. They had been taught. What was it? Thou art a spirit, thou will be a spirit forever. Remember how people would stand atop the Ramiumptum and utter that? How can you disbelieve on the Son of God? You have to start at the foundation. 
For it is not written that Zenos alone spake of these things, but Zenoch also spake of these things. For behold, he said, now here's Zenoch's prayer. Thou art angry, O Lord, with this people, because they will not understand thy mercies, which thou hast bestowed upon them because of thy Son. There it is again. Now, my brethren, ye have seen that a second prophet of old has testified of the Son of God. So you see both of them establishing not just the necessity of prayer, but the redemption through the Son of God. Okay? Let's try another message from the brass plates. Um, let's go back to 1 Nephi 22. 1 Nephi 22. Now, what's going on here? Nephi has just quoted from Isaiah, just quoted from Isaiah 48 and 49, I want us to pick up in 1 Nephi 22, about verse 15. Would someone read for us verse 15? Remember, we're noting how many times that the prophet is mentioned. Who's got 15? Please. For behold, saith the prophet, the time cometh speedily that Satan shall have no more power over the hearts of the children of men. For the day soon cometh that all the proud, and they who do wickedly, shall be a stubble, and the day cometh that they must be burned. Does that language sound familiar? The day cometh that uh, those who are wicked shall be a stubble. Well, let's don't answer yet. Let's, I want to show you another place. Um, look over at verses 23 and 24, same chapter. Nephi talking about the destruction that will come toward the end of time. Would you go ahead and read 23 and 24, please? For the time speedily shall come that all churches who are built up to get gain, and all those who are built up to get power over the flesh, and those who are built up to become popular in the eyes of the world, and those who seek the lust of the flesh and the things in the world, and to do all manner of iniquity, yea, and find all those who belong to the kingdom of the devil, are they who need fear and tremble and quake. They are those who must be brought low in the dust. They are those who must be consumed as stubble, and this is according to the words of the prophet. There's that phrase again, the prophet. Notice that language again, consumed as stubble. Read one more, verse 24. And the time cometh speedily that the righteous must be led up as calves of the stall, and the Holy One of Israel must reign in dominion and might and power and great glory. One more, I want us to read one more and then we'll draw some conclusions. Look back over with me to Second Nephi chapter 26. Verse 9. Second Nephi 26, verse 9. Would someone like to... Why don't you go ahead and read that as well. Got it? But the Son of Righteousness shall appear unto them, and he shall heal them, and they shall have peace with him. Unto three generations shall have passed away, and many of the fourth generation shall have passed away in righteousness. Having read those two or three passages, I want to now read something from Malachi. Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, I just want to read these. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Notice the similarity of language. Now we've got a little bit of a problem here. Give me a rough date for Nephi. 600 B.C., 550 B.C., somewhere in there. Now give me a date for Malachi. 400 to 500 B.C. So we've got Nephi quoting Malachi a hundred years before Malachi said it. Could I suggest an alternative? That Nephi and Malachi are both drawing upon Zenos. Okay? Again from Elder McConkie. This is, this is a great statement. I really like this. He says, Our understanding of the prophetic word will be greatly expanded if we know how one prophet quotes another, usually without acknowledging his source. It's refreshing, isn't it? Either Isaiah or Micah copied the prophetic words of the other relative to the mountain of the Lord's house. 
some unnamed Old Testament prophet, who obviously was Zenos, as the Book of Mormon testifies, spoke of the day when the wicked would be destroyed as stubble, when the righteous would be led up as calves of the stall, when Christ should rise from the dead with healing in his wings, and when the Holy One of Israel would then reign on earth. Malachi, who lived more than 200 years after Nephi, uses these very expressions in his prophetic writings. Can we do other than conclude that both Nephi and Malachi had before them the writings of Zenos? Let me go on. This gets interesting. Both Paul and Mormon expounded with great inspiration about faith, hope, and charity, in many verses using the same words and phrases. If there's any difference between them, it's that Mormon expounds the doctrines more perfectly and persuasively than does Paul. It does not take much insight to know that Mormon and Paul both had before them the writings of some Old Testament prophet on the same subject. It's perfectly clear that John the Beloved is copying, in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, words written by John the Baptist, a practice with which we have no fault to find. Once the Lord has revealed his doctrine in precise language to a chosen prophet, there's no reason why he should inspire another prophet to choose the same words in presenting the same doctrine on a subsequent occasion. It's much easier and simpler to quote that which has already been given in perfection. We're all commanded, including the prophets among us, to search the scriptures and thereby learn what other prophets have presented. And so isn't it interesting that as we were reading along from second, first and second Nephi, we find Nephi drawing upon an ancient source just as Malachi drew upon an ancient source. Um, let's just turn to 2 Nephi chapter 3. Here's another great message, and we won't go into this in any detail, but uh, who is our teacher here and who's our student? Who's our teacher? Lehi. Lehi. Who's our student? Joseph. Joseph. Now, here's another example. I said earlier, if you and I want to approximate the brass plates and the message of the brass plates, look to the Joseph Smith translation. Second Nephi chapter 3, as you recall, is Lehi's uh, prophetic statement to his son Joseph drawn up from the prophecies of Joseph of old concerning the last days, the call of Joseph Smith, the restoration of the gospel, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Let me suggest that this is but an excerpt. A much longer recitation of this is contained in the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis chapter 50. Okay? And so we have these prophecies of Joseph of old. Look over in chapter 4. After we've, com after we've completed the prophecies, look in chapter 4. Nephi speaks now. Verse 1, Now I, Nephi, speak concerning the prophecies of which my father hath spoken, concerning Joseph, who was carried into Egypt. For behold, he truly prophesied concerning all his seed, and the prophecies which he wrote, there are not many greater. And he prophesied concerning us and our future generations, and they are written upon the plates of brass. So also upon the plates of brass, the prophecies of Joseph. We don't even have the time, nor the inclination, to talk about all the things of Isaiah we could learn that are on the plates of brass. Let me have us go to Alma 13. Alma chapter 13. Again, we're in the middle of a lengthy sermon, series of sermons that Alma and Amulek were giving to a pretty wicked people. Alma chapter 13. We're going to pick up at about verse 14. You know, sometimes when you begin reading and rereading and rereading and rereading passages and chapters and books, you begin seeing relationships. You see themes that weave themselves through those books. For example, let me just suggest, if you want to have an interesting experience, read chapters 12 and 13 of Alma looking just for the phrase, rest of the Lord. It's all through here, the rest of the Lord, entering into the rest of the Lord. Drawing upon those ancient prophets again, those ancient peoples, Alma is saying those ancient people, the children of Israel, couldn't pull it off because of their stubbornness and their rebellion. Let's don't be like them. Let's open ourselves to the revelations of the Holy Ghost so that we can enter into the rest of the Lord. So he says, be in tune with the atoning powers of Christ. Get your sins forgiven. When he moves into chapter 13, as we have it, 
he begins talking about priesthood and priesthood powers. He talks about those who hold the Melchizedek priesthood in this life, having been foreordained to that before they came here. He talks about, in, verse, in chapter 13, for example, verse 11, therefore they were called after this holy order, people in old times, and were sanctified, and their garments were washed white through the blood of the Lamb. Now they, after, having, they after being sanctified by the Holy Ghost, having their garments made white, being pure and spotless before God, could not look upon sin, save it were with abhorrence, and so on. They went on and entered into the rest of the Lord. And then he chooses one illustration. His illustration is Melchizedek. Do it the way Melch Let's do it the way Melchizedek did it. Let's start in verse 14, then, and I want us to read this, keeping in mind, how would Alma know about Melchizedek? Well, obviously the Lord could reveal by vision or whatever about Melchizedek, or he could study the brass plates. Would someone like to pick up in verse 14, please? Yea, humble yourselves, even as the people in the days of Melchizedek, who was also a high priest after this same order which I have spoken, who also took upon him the high priesthood forever. And it was this same Melchizedek to whom Abraham paid tithes, yea, even our father Abraham paid tithes of one-tenth part of all he possessed. Now these ordinances were given after this manner, that thereby the people might look forward on the Son of God it being a type of his order, or it being his order, and this, that they might look forward to him for a remission of their sins, that they might enter into the rest of the Lord. Now this Melchizedek was a king over the land of Salem, and his people had waxed strong in, in iniquity and abomination. Yea, they had all gone astray, and they were full of all manner of wickedness. But Melchizedek, having exercised mighty faith and received the office of the high priesthood according to the holy order of God, did preach repentance unto, this, unto his people, and behold, they did repent, and Melchizedek did establish peace in the land in his days. Therefore he was called the Prince of Peace, for he was the King of Salem, and he did reign under his father. I want to pause there. Where's the other place I would learn about the detail about Melchizedek? There's not many other places to go. The other place is the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 14. Now notice what's said in the next verse, which is very interesting. Read 19. Now there were many before him, and also there were many afterwards, but none were greater. Therefore of him they have more particularly made mention. Um, who has more particularly made mention of him? Melchizedek is a really enigmatic figure in Christian and Jewish history. Nobody knows anything about Melchizedek. Weird legends have grown up about Melchizedek. It's interesting to me that among uh, the people that Joseph Smith talks about a great deal, Things that Joseph Smith has revealed to him, they're about Melchizedek. It seems to me that Alma is drawing upon those brass plates to learn what he learned about Melchizedek. They've, they've, the praise in verse 19 is unparalleled. There were no people that did it any better than Melchizedek did. Of him they have more particularly made mention. They who? Well, they who kept other records that Alma had read, not the ones we've read. Let's try... Uh, Helaman again, Helaman chapter 8. We referred to a portion of this chapter a few moments ago, but uh, I want us to pick up in about verse 14. Um, remember the setting here. This is Nephi testifying of Christ, and, and how do you testify? You draw upon the old prophets and have them testify, then you bear witness. We need somebody to pick up with verse 14, people's testimony of the Messiah. Go ahead. Yea, did he not bear record that the Son of God should come? And as he lifted up the brazen serpent in the wilderness, even so shall he be lifted up who should come. Go on, through 17. And as many as should look upon that serpent should live, even so as many as should look upon the Son of God with faith having a contrite spirit, might live even unto that life which is eternal. And now behold, Moses did not only testify of these things, but also all the holy prophets from his days, even to the days of Abraham. Now note this verse in particular, and I want you to try to figure out the biblical incident to which this is referring. Yea, and behold, Abraham saw of his coming, and was filled with, his, with gladness, and did rejoice. Now, where can you go in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, to find an occasion where Abraham saw the coming of the Son of Man and rejoiced? 
I'd recommend that you'll have difficulty finding that. Okay? It's not there. But notice, interestingly, in the New Testament what happens. Jesus is debating with the Pharisees in John chapter 8, and he said, Jesus says to them, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. And of course, they misunderstand, and they say, thou art not yet 50 years old. Hast thou seen Abraham? That's not what he said. He said, Abraham saw me. Now, what's going on? Let me read you something out of the... Uh, Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 15. Abram said, Lord God, how wilt thou give me this land for an everlasting inheritance? And the Lord said, Though thou wast dead, yet am I not able to give it thee? And if thou shalt die, yet thou shalt possess it, for the day cometh that the Son of Man shall live. But how can he live if he be not dead? He must first be quickened. What did Abraham understand? the resurrection. Now listen to this. And it came to pass that Abram looked forth and saw the days of the Son of Man and was glad. And his soul found rest, and he believed in the Lord. And the Lord counted it unto him for righteousness. The JST of Genesis 15, 9 to 12, restored through Joseph Smith. Alma's drawing upon something. Helaman's drawing upon something. These great prophets drawing upon things we don't have access to except as God has revealed it through modern prophets, okay? Let's just take a moment and turn our attention, in just a moment, because we could spend hours, to Jacob chapter 5, the lengthy allegory of Zenos. And we don't even have the time to develop many of the verses. But if I really wanted to know what this chapter is all about, what do I do? Where do I go? Where do we get this, by the way? This is the allegory of Zenos. The longest chapter, as it were, in the Book of Mormon. And what are we drawing from? A prophecy of a brass plates prophet. If I wanted to know what this meant, where do I go? Well, I could study it intensely for a lifetime, and that's about what it takes, I think, to make sense out of it. Or I could get Jacob's commentary on it in the next chapter, which is Jacob chapter 6. I just want you to think about this. What does this represent? In one sense, this is a, uh, a panoramic vision of the destiny of, of the house of Israel. It's a, uh, a, a, from pre-mortal times through millennial times. It's the things God has in store for his special chosen people. It's also the great mystery, as Jacob calls it in chapter 4. I will unfold unto you this mystery. And how does he do it? He draws upon his, his prophetic colleague, Zenos. What is the message of the allegory of Zenos? God just will not let Israel go. He'll work with her, and he'll cut that tree, and he will prune that tree, and he will dung that tree, and he'll do whatever it takes Look back in chapter 6 and see if this isn't a great summary. It isn't that we have to know the particulars of Jacob 5. I hope we don't to be saved. Uh, I know a couple of them. But maybe it's the, the greater message, the grander message of Jacob chapter 6. Look at verse 4. How merciful is our God unto us! For he remembereth the house of Israel, both roots and branches. And he stretches forth his hands unto them all the day long. And they are stiff-necked and a gainsaying people. But as many as will not harden their hearts shall be saved in the kingdom of God. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, I beseech of you in words of soberness that you would repent and come with full purpose of heart and cleave unto God as he cleaveth unto you. And while his arm of mercy is extended towards you in the light of day, harden not your hearts. Yea, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, for why will ye die? For behold, after ye have been nourished by the good word of God all the day long, will you bring forth evil fruit, that it must be hewn down and cast into the fire? Will you reject the words? Will you reject the words of the prophets, and so forth? There, there really is the central message of the allegory. But again, what is it? It's coming from a brass plate's prophet. Let's begin to, to draw this draw some conclusions from this discussion. Let's, let's go back to 1 Nephi 22, the very end 
of Nephi's first book. First Nephi 22, verse 30. Would someone like to read that for us? Who's got it? Please. Wherefore, my brethren, I would that ye should consider that the things which have been written upon the plates of brass are true, and they testify that a man must be obedient to the commandments of God. Kind of a nice summary, isn't it? What's there is right and true, and they tell you you ought to do the right stuff, okay? Let's try another one. Let's go over to Mosiah chapter 1. Here's Benjamin's tribute to the brass plates. Mosiah chapter 1. Well, let's look at verse, uh, notice in verses 1 and 2, he's talking to his sons, Mosiah, Hiloram, and Helaman. We need somebody to read verses 3 and 4. Who's got them? Please. And he also taught them concerning the records which were engraven upon the plates of brass, saying, My sons, I would that ye should remember that were it not for these plates which contain these records and these commandments, we must have suffered in ignorance, even at this present time, not knowing the mysteries of God. For it were not possible that our father Lehi could have remembered all these things to have them taught to his children, except it were for the help of these plates. For he having been taught in the language of the Egyptians, Therefore he could read these engravings and teach them to his children, that thereby they could teach them to their children and so fulfilling the commandments of God, even down to this present time. Besides the little, little detail, it's fairly interesting that they were written in Egyptian. Notice what they do. They provide a corporate memory, if you will, an institutional memory. Let me just read to you without us turning to it from Alma's testimony to his son. And now it has hitherto been wisdom in God that these things should be preserved. For behold, they have enlarged the memory of this people, yea, and convinced many of the error of their ways, and brought them to the knowledge of their God and to the salvation of their souls. Okay? Now let's close with this thought. The destiny of the brass plates. When Lehi gets this record, he searches them. He rejoices and he prophesies. First Nephi chapter 5, he prophesies that these brass plates will go forth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people who are of his seed. But in Alma chapter 37, Alma's a little more expansive. He just says they'll go forth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Now how's that going to be? Well, obviously they're going to go forth what we have of the brass plates through the Book of Mormon. That's one way. But there is another. Finally, from Elder McConkie, he said, Someday the Lord will raise up a prophet who will also be a seer and a translator to whom he will give the brass plates that they may be translated for the benefit and blessing of those in all nations. Would God that the work might commence at least in our day, though in fact we have no such hope. Why should the Lord give us what is on the brass plates or in the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon? When, when we do not even treasure up and live by what we have already been given. And so, yes, it'll go forth through this means, the Book of Mormon, but surely one day we'll get the whole record. Can you see what's going on here? What an interesting thing the brass plates proved to be. They're a story within a story. Here we're telling the Nephrite story. We wonder sometimes why so much effort to go back and get those plates. But it wasn't just a matter of having the scriptures to read, you and, I, you and I benefit so dramatically from the truths that come from these brass plates. What a powerful message, as we started and said earlier. When that sword of Laban was held up, it wasn't just God will lead us in battle, but it's the price to be paid from the scriptures. I testify like the prophets of the Book of Mormon did that the truths that are contained on the plates of brass are true and pure and right and good. They will bless us. This is a way, through the Book of Mormon, the Lord is blessing the world. He's blessing the world through getting the message of the brass plates, perhaps something far more extensive than we have ever appreciated, into the world's hands. I'm grateful for those prophets, the Zenus and the Zenic and the Isaiah and the Nahum, who stood up and in some cases gave their very lives 
that the testimony of Jesus and the message of the gospel might go to future generations, people they didn't even know. That's a courage and that's a commitment I think we could imitate. That we will do so is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.